The Berghof, Hitler's alpine refuge near Berchtesgaden. This is where Adolf Hitler liked to retire from the public with a woman by his side. Eva Braun was Hitler's lover. He kept their relationship a secret from the German people. Private film recordings show Eva, her sister, and architect Albert Speer's wife picking flowers. To this day, she is considered a non-political, naive adjunct of the mass murderer. But who was this blonde, who is also called Satan's bride? Eva Braun was a young Eva Braun was a young, blonde and attractive woman. She was very much into sports. On photographs, she appeared to be very joyful and lively. During the more than 13 years of their relationship, this girl from a lower middle class family turned into the uncompromising companion of the dictator. Underneath this often fake facade, there was a very determined woman who tried to achieve her goals with an incredible toughness and consistency. It showed already quite early, and she also stressed it to Hitler that she would take things to the last consequence, even to her death. Her biographer wrote that Eva Braun was vain, caught between power and impotence, and by no means a victim. She earned her name in history, even though it's a dubious one. One of the few film recordings that show Adolf Hitler together with his lover on the terrace of the Berghof. Eva Braun wurde immer Eva Braun was always depicted as a slightly dumb blonde, and Hitler as the detached leader, the inhuman monster, who was unable to lead a regular private life. But now we know that this wasn't the case at all. Both had a very close relationship for more than 13 years. And he wasn't detached, but rather tolerant and protective towards her. Everything that pointed to her existence was supposed to be destroyed after their joint suicide in 1945 but the private recordings of Eva Brown survived and allow insights into a rather strange relationship. He seems like the complete opposite of her, a bit uptight, elderly, tensed up. At first sight, they don't seem to fit together at all, but if you look behind the scenes, you can see that they had a lot of common interests. They both loved movies, the opera and operetta, and what really defined their relationship was their commitment towards each other, total faith and loyalty. In 1946, several hours of film recordings and dozens of photo albums were discovered at the Austrian home of an SS soldier who failed to destroy the materials. Those images allow a look behind the curtains that wasn't made public to the Germans during the Nazi period. They give the illusion of a harmless, idyllic life. Officially, Hitler's lover was employed at the Berghof as his private secretary. She and her younger sister, Gretel, were amateur film enthusiasts and documented many private moments for years. Die bunte Filmschau, aufgenommen von Eva Braun, Colourful movie moments recorded by Eva Braun was mainly supposed to entertain Hitler's inner circle. She called this film Pünktchen am Berg. It was presumably recorded in the summer of 1937. 16mm colour film had become available only recently, and the Braun sisters enjoyed spending their time with this unusual toy. Beside Eva Braun sat her friend Marion Schoenemann and the wife of Hitler's private secretary, Gerda Bormann. They took turns in taking photos and filming each other. Gretel Braun, on the right, was as enthusiastic about filming as her older sister. Hitler was absent most of the time, so bathing trips with family and friends were a welcome change. 
Ava Brown especially liked to have her sports activities filmed. At Lake Starnberg, Ava and Gretel were joined by their mother, Franziska, and father, Friedrich Braun. The Führer's lover was 25 at that time. Little is known about Ava Braun's childhood and teenage years. Her photo albums provide an insight into her early life. Eva Anna Paula Braun was born in Munich on February the 6th, 1912, the second of three daughters to vocational school teacher Friedrich Braun. Her parents' marriage had survived a crisis during the early 20s. Eva grew up in a middle-class environment in Munich, Schwabing. Ava Brown was also the center of attention during a bathing trip to Wirt Lake. Like every year, the Brown's relatives from Jena visited Munich and accompanied the family on their trips. Cousin Gertraud greatly enjoyed the time in the water. Aunt Fanny and Uncle Fritz were very fond of 13-year-old Ava. Gertraud kept their relationship with the Browns a secret for more than 60 years. Only her husband knew and forbade her to mention it. Not until the year 2000 did Gertraud Weiske decide to provide information about her cousin, Ava Brown. We met with my aunt once or twice a week and went on a trip somewhere to Chiemsee or Amazee. Sometimes Eva and her sisters joined us. I enjoyed their visits a lot. It was a great family time. We went swimming or had coffee and cake and returned to our quarters at my grandparents' in the evening. My father never joined us. He made it quite clear that he didn't want any contact with Eva. Eva's relationship with her parents wasn't as relaxed as the films might suggest. Her best friend later reported that Ava spent most of her youth at her parents' place, as the atmosphere at Ava's home wasn't very pleasant. Ava took courses in housekeeping, bookkeeping and typewriting at a Catholic boarding school. In 1929, she successfully applied for an apprenticeship at a well-known Munich photo shop. Heinrich Hoffmann was the shrewd personal photographer to Adolf Hitler. At one point, he introduced his new worker to him. This is our brave little Fräulein Eva. Apparently, the two of them met frequently afterwards. Hitler confided to his adjutant, for love, I keep a girl in Munich. She was 17 and he was 40 years old. This elderly bachelor apparently was smitten by this girl and she found him impressive, as did many women at the time. And so did her boss, Heinrich Hoffmann, whose part in the initiation of this relationship stays rather inconclusive to this day. Eva Brown's private photo albums shed a light on the true story. In 1931, she was allowed to accompany Hitler to Obersalzberg for the first time. There were no photos showing the two of them together. The blonde felt neglected. She wanted him to commit himself to her totally, even turning her father's gun on herself. She was a rather joyful and naive 17-year-old, but at the same time, she was quite extroverted. She liked her picture taken and was by no means a shy girl. 
Their relationship grew closer. Hitler told Heinrich Hoffmann that he realized from the incident that the girl really was in love with him and that he felt the moral obligation to care for her. Ava Brown's family was anything but euphoric about this relationship without a marriage certificate. I was nine years old when I got wind of it by reading it in the papers. I saw a photo of Eva and Hitler. I think he was on it too. And the caption read, Eva Braun, a teacher's daughter from Munich, is Hitler's new favorite. I showed it to my mother and she said, don't talk about this, it's not true, this is nonsense, and I don't want it mentioned again. As Hitler made no attempts to legitimize that relationship, Eva Braun was considered his mistress by her relatives. Photos of that time show her as a fashionable young woman who apparently was more interested in hairstyles and clothing than politics. Her cousin Gertraud recalls, This attractive young woman was 12 years my senior, a very attractive woman, and I admired her and her sister. She was well groomed with her long fingernails, and I enjoyed meeting and spending time with them. Aber mit zehn Jahren, da macht man sich keinen Gedanken darüber. As a 10-year-old, I didn't wonder whether I wanted to become like her and didn't really think about it. We fooled around like young girls do. She was very much into sports, dived from the highest platforms, whereas I only managed the lowest one. Despite the feelings of my other relatives and the difference in age, I idolized her as the athletic young woman she was. The private film recordings from 1937 only show the joyful side of the Führer's lover, who suffered from her relationship with Hitler. It had only been two years since Eva Brown's emotional low. Fragments from her diary survived. She noted on May the 10th, 1935, Ms. Hoffman told me both in a loving and tactless way that he now has a substitute for me. I would say, after what I know today, from what I know today, I would say that she was pretty depressive. And she always had to disguise this depression with sports, with clothing. She always needed to distract herself from her sorrows. But nobody realized it in everyday life. He should know me well enough to see that I would never put obstacles in his way if he should fall in love with another woman. Why should he care about what becomes of me? 23-year-old Ava's manic depressive moods soon became apparent to her family. Her family knew. I didn't, but in retrospect, all this changing of clothes was manic behavior. She changed five or six times a day at the Berghof, where basically nobody was there to see and admire her. She did it just for herself. And she also found it hard to concentrate. She used to ask me, what are you doing? And when I started telling her about mass or something, she just replied, never mind. She quickly lost focus, deliberately or not. She complained, Hitler only needs me for certain things. When the dictator was traveling, she didn't hear from him. Eva Braun attempted suicide for a second time on May the 28th, 1935, this time with sleeping pills. She noted, this time I'll take 35 pills. I want to make absolutely sure if he'd only call. Cool. 
The Selbstmordversuch Eva Brauns zeigt, Eva Brown's suicide attempt shows that this relationship at the time had evolved into something deeper. It wasn't superficial anymore, and something had gone wrong. He could have been appalled by it and could have tried to get rid of her. But instead, he saw it as a proof of her total commitment and loyalty, which was exactly what he expected from his disciples. Loyalty until death. And she was ready to give and live it. Eva's parents reproached her constantly and made it impossible for her to remain at their home. Finally, she moved to a house in the elegant district of Borgenhausen, which Heinrich Hoffmann bought by order of the Führer. Hitler's private apartment was close by. Eventually, she was allowed to quit her job at the photo shop. For appearances' sake, her sister Gretel also moved to the small house with a garden. In 1938, Eva Braun became its official owner. I didn't know who had given her the house. All I knew was that she and Gretel moved out of their former home and moved there now. They were old enough to do so after all. But I didn't know anything else about that house, that it was a present of Hitler's. Nobody ever talked about it. Lavish parties were frequently held at the house, but the mood was anything but festive, as Eva's father didn't want to accept the disgrace that she was bringing upon the family. Her biographer doubts the credibility of Friedrich Braun's later statement that he had written a letter to Hitler ordering his daughter to return to the family home. As here, to date, it was assumed that her father was against National Socialism. But the questioning he had to go through after 1945 showed that he apparently believed in the Führer until the end. Therefore, nobody in the family was in opposition to the regime. Zu diesem System gegeben. Es hat niemanden in dieser Familie gegeben, der sich im Widerstand. Everybody benefited from it, from the mother to the youngest daughter. Von der Mutter bis zur jüngsten Schwester. There was no falling out with the family. On the contrary, Eva's parents were now also welcome guests at Obersalzberg. Like their daughter, they accepted the fact that Hitler wouldn't marry his life partner. Apparently, Franziska Braun convinced her husband that resisting this relationship, especially as it was quite persistent, would be futile. Any daughter can get a husband, but someone like Hitler? That was something different. Eva Braun used uncharacteristic toughness and well-aimed intrigues to drive possible rivals for Hitler's favor away from Obersalzberg. Her position there became undisputed over the years. I'm the lover of Germany's and the world's greatest man, she allegedly once said. Officially, there was no talk of any woman at Hitler's side. The dictator said, my bride is Germany. Nazi propaganda claimed that the Führer had no private life. He served the German people day and night. Film and photography had become Eva Braun's biggest passions. She loved to stage her lover on the Berghof's terrace. The film seemed to show the Führer transported to another world, distanced from his people, welcoming friends and political companions up there. Some of her photo spreads survived uncensored in her private albums, showing Eva Braun's professional work. The films and photos Eva Braun shot of Hitler and the people at the Berghof weren't just of a private nature. She still worked for Heinrich Hoffmann and also created those works to sell them, and she sometimes got big sums of money for them. 
und erhielt dafür sehr viel Geld zum Teil. Für eine einzige Fotoarbeit 20.000 One single photo for 20.000 Reichmarks, for example. She was part of the propaganda machinery, part of Hoffmann's propaganda department, who staged the Führer's private appearances. She presented him as a caring family man, a child-loving patron. This doesn't really fit with the perception people used to have of her, that she made those photos only because she dreamt of a family life with Hitler. No, she used those photos for business, and Hitler was well aware of that. It was part of the plan. Among the most welcomed guests at the Berghof were Hitler's favorite architect Albert Speer and Joachim von Ribbentrop, who was appointed foreign minister in 1938. Heinrich Hoffmann and his wife were also often present. Hitler verließ sich im Grunde genommen in der Zusammenstellung dieser Berghof. In regards to the selection of people around him at the Berghof, Hitler mainly relied on Heinrich Hoffmann and Eva Braun. This entourage basically was his emotional foundation. His private life took place in the surrounding of these people, whereas his biological family was kept apart. From 1936, they never visited the Berghof. He met with them separately. He selected his own replacement family, which consisted of the Speers, the Bormanns, his doctor's families, the Hoffmanns and Eva Braun and her family. This circle was so important to him that he often retreated to the Berghof before making important political decisions among this familiar surrounding. Invitations to the Berghof were highly coveted among the Nazi notables. Even though life up there appeared to be quite stuffy, some of the guests claimed that this petty bourgeois idyll felt intoxicating to them. All that remains of the social life on Obersalzberg are memories of a strange emptiness, Albert Speer wrote later. Hitler hardly ever mentioned the Jews, his political opponents, or even the necessity of building concentration camps. I suppose this wasn't intentional, but rather due to the banal nature of the conversation. Those people of the inner circle were aware of Hitler's special living arrangements. After a while, they took for granted that Eva Braun played the part of the lady of the house on such occasions. She wasn't a political person. She hardly ever tried to influence Hitler. But of course, people talked about politics at the Berghof, in the women's presence as well. They weren't involved in the decision-making or military planning. But there were discussions about how to proceed with Austria, after the so-called annexation, for example. Hitler's secretary, Martin Bormann, was also part of the inner circle. He made sure that all the neighbors disappeared from around the Berghof and supervised its transformation to a secure, restricted area for the Führer. Hitler liked to sleep long and usually ate lunch at three o'clock in the afternoon. This was often followed by a long walk with his guests. This time, Ribbentrop appears to be Hitler's preferred conversation partner. Several delicate political matters were discussed confidentially. The foreign minister was a loyal henchman to the dictator, implicitly supporting his plans for war. The destination was always the same, the scenic outpost at Moorslana Kopf. When the weather is good, there's a superb view towards Salzburg from there. Nearby, Bormann had a tea house built for Hitler. Albert Speer later recalled, at the coffee table, Hitler often liked to lose himself in endless monologues. 
Ava Brown filmed a talk with national youth leader Baldur von Schirach from a respectful distance. Albert Speer was one of the most frequent visitors. He moved with his family to a house close to the Berghof in 1938 and was good friends with Ava Brown. He claimed after 1945 that she took advantage of her position, like all other prominent collaborators of Hitler. Only few resisted the temptations of being in his entourage. Hitler didn't really resist this development, Speer recalled later. The specific circumstances of his style of leadership led him to increasing loneliness, Speer believed. According to him, Hitler was unable to form normal human relationships. He continued, in hundreds of talks, he covered topics like fashion, dog breeding, theater and film, operetta and its stars. Sometimes Hitler fell asleep during his own monologues. Once in a while, the Führer's lover took exceptional photos that would never have been published during his lifetime. They document their special relationship. Ava Brown enjoyed playing the hostess who calls the tune according to her standing. Building the Kehlstein House was the highlight of Bormann's building work at Obersalzberg. In order that the Führer and his entourage could reach its vantage point at 1,800 meters, a road and an elevator needed to be cut into the mountain's rock. But Hitler rarely appeared. It is said that he suffered from vertigo. But Ava Brown enjoyed coming there. She seemed much more playful when the dictator wasn't around. A series of photos shows Hitler and Ava Brown at the Kehlstein House with Magda Goebbels, the propaganda minister's wife, by his side. She had fled to the Berghof with her children and played her part as the betrayed and indignant wife. She complained to the Führer that her husband was having an affair with Czech actress Lida Barova and wanted to establish a ménage à trois. Hitler was enraged and ordered Josef Goebbels to come to the Obersalzberg. It's not clear if these film recordings of Ava Brown show Goebbels' arrival that day or during another visit. The Führer's word of command forced Goebbels to separate from his lover, and Hitler forbade his propaganda minister any further contact with the actress. The marriage with Magda had to be maintained due to reasons of state. Goebbels obeyed the order. This photo of the 1938 New Year party documents the Führer's and Eva Brown's quasi-marital relationship. Hitler, the professed vegetarian, got his own menu, which Eva Brown put into her photo album. The results the dictator got during the traditional lead pouring are not documented. 1939 was the turning point in Hitler's rule. He had achieved one success after another, rearmed Germany, incorporated the Tsar region, the Sudetenland, and the whole of Austria into the Third Reich. Even his opponents agreed that he would have been the greatest German since Bismarck if he had died at that point. But the dictator aimed for war, and therefore this moment marked the beginning of his demise. Even though Eva Braun was a good skier, Hitler didn't like her to ski, as he was afraid of her being injured. But once, when the dictator was away from Obersalzberg, he allowed her to go skiing with Albert Speer for eight days in Austria. Speer later remembered that she danced with young officers until the early morning without being recognized. According to Speer, they both were united in their resentment of Martin Bormann due to his arrogant and crude way of abusing nature and cheating on his wife. 
During Easter time in 1939, Ava Brown filmed the many children of Speer and Bormann on their hunt for Easter eggs. The children lived secluded from the world on Obersalzberg. It's not known if Ava Brown wished to have children. There were rumors that she once had an abortion in Munich, but there's no proof of that. Speer had sympathy for the unfortunate woman. According to him, Hitler once said in her presence, very intelligent men should choose a primitive and simple-minded wife. And imagine I had a wife who meddled in my affairs. I want peace and quiet in my spare time. Meanwhile, the dictator preferred to rule Nazi Germany from the Berghof. There, he developed crucial political and military plans, issued laws and decrees. One of the reasons may have been his firmer relationship with Eva Braun, who always happened to be at Obersalzberg when Hitler was there with his entourage. An adjutant later recalled that it became more and more difficult to obtain decisions from the head of state. It was often impossible, even for representatives from the party and the government, to reach Hitler when he was at Obersalzberg. Only cultural events seemed to be able to lure artist Monquet Hitler from his command center at Obersalzberg. In June 1939, he spontaneously traveled to Vienna to attend the 75th birthday of composer Richard Strauss. On his way back to Berchtesgaden, the Führer visited places where he spent his childhood. Ava Brown filmed his arrival at Fischelheim Primary School near Linz. In his book, Mein Kampf, Hitler described himself as a little ringleader when the boys of the village played cops and robbers. His class teacher later remembered a skinny, pale boy who despised learning, neglected his talents, and wasn't able to follow school discipline. Back at the Berghof, the dictator planned the imminent military campaign against Poland. In the meantime, the Brown family decided to go on an unusual cruise. Mother Francisca was filmed during her visit to a travel agent's, where she booked a trip to Scandinavia for her and her daughters, Ava and Gretel. Friedrich Brown wasn't part of the tour party. The little tour group arrived in Hamburg shortly thereafter to board the cruise ship Milwaukee. The Browns, with Ava behind the camera, crossed the harbor on a launch. The Milwaukee was operated by the National Socialist Organization Kraft durch Freude, strength through joy, to provide holiday cruises for ordinary national comrades. The former North Atlantic passenger steamer, built in 1929 in Hamburg, had room for 600 guests and was very popular as a cruise ship. Its destination this time, the Norwegian fjords. Ava Brown made a well-groomed appearance on board. Her suits were made by high-class Berlin tailors. Still, Albert Speer described her in his memoirs as modestly and unobtrusively dressed and that she wore notably cheap jewelry. The first-class passengers passed their time at the pool. Frequently in the camera's focus was Gretel, the younger sister. A shore excursion in northern Norway. Of course, the locals didn't know that the lover of Nazi Germany's dictator was one of the tourists. 
foreign publications frequently wrote that Hitler was liaised with a certain A.V. Brown, but they apparently lacked reliable information. Journalist Robert Arndt wrote in a booklet entitled The Women in Hitler's Life that was published in New York in 1944, A.V. Brown is hardly the typical Aryan glamour girl. She may be blonde and blue-eyed, but she is stout and ungainly in her appearance. She resembles the image of a German middle-class hausfrau rather than first lady of the Reich. A.V. hasn't always been the conservative housewife she is now. In the early days of her relationship with Hitler, she was known for the drinks she served the Nazis, and even the Führer. She also had a talent for producing perfumes, and it is rumoured that she mixed erotic scents to attract the Führer. Obviously, this description was totally fabricated, and Nazi censorship made sure that it wasn't published in Germany. Gretel relaxed at the pool in her fashionable two-piece swimsuit. She simply adapted to the needs of her older sister, acting as companion and chaperone. Another highlight of the cruise, lobster was served on deck at lunchtime. The Browns wallowed in luxury while their daughter's partner at home was preparing to plunge Europe into another war. On June the 17th, 1939, Hitler welcomed the special emissary of the Saudi Arabian king for a meeting. During diplomatic meetings, Ava Brown was usually confined to her chambers. She was even ordered to stay in her rooms when important party officials came to the Berghof. Albert Speer believed that Hitler considered her social acceptability to be limited. On such occasions, even the big reception hall was out of bounds for Hitler's lover. When the prominent guests stayed longer, she even had to move to the house of the unpopular Martin Bormann nearby. Sometimes she succeeded in filming scenes like these from a first floor window. Hitler awaits a visitor on the Berghof stairs. A guard of honor from the SS gets in position. Hitler was convinced during his rise to power that Germany's former greatness could only be achieved by another war where countries were conquered. Of course, this would need to be done by force. There would be war, and he wanted to start it when he was still physically fit to lead it. The thought of sickness or an early death made him expedite his plans for war. He wanted to start it sooner rather than later. Hitler didn't consider war as something shameful or that should be avoided. Poland would be his first casualty. On August the 12th, 1939, Ava Brown had to disappear from the scene once more. From a safe distance, she filmed a unit of the Leibstandarte SS that were lined up for the reception of Italy's foreign minister, Count Ciano, who had come to discuss Italy entering the war with Hitler. It isn't clear if Heinrich Hoffmann shot this close-up photo of the visitor. Ava Brown's note in her photo album reads, there's something forbidden up there, me. Hitler informed his ally about his decision to attack Poland. Ava Brown called these snapshots of the guest of state's departure, departure viewed from the hotel room's perspective. During that time, Ava Brown was able to film SS Chief Heinrich Himmler with his associates Reinhard Heydrich and Karl Wolf on the Berghof Terrace. On several occasions, the dictator discussed the details of war, terror and mass murder with his henchmen at Obersalzberg. 
Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop also took part in Hitler's talks about his war plans. As peace in Europe hung by a thread, the Führer isolated himself from the ministerial bureaucracy and assembled his confidants. The dictator planned a special coup. Ribbentrop was supposed to travel to Moscow in order to sign a non-aggression pact with Stalin. Heinrich Himmler and his enforcer, Reinhard Heydrich, meticulously prepared the brutal oppression of Poland. They presented the details during their visit at the Berghof. So-called Einsatztruppen, special action squads derived from police and security forces, were to liquidate the Polish ruling classes as Hitler intended to occupy the country permanently. On August the 23rd, 1939, Hitler nervously awaited positive news from Moscow. Ava Brown's presence was permitted that day. She filmed and took photos. The caption of her professional photo documentation reads, then Ribbentrop traveled to Moscow. When Ribbentrop confirmed the pact with the devil, the dictator rejoiced, this will hit like a bomb. Other photos show Hitler, Bormann and Goebbels as the news was spread officially. Ava Brown's comment, Hitler listens to the news on the radio. Still, Poland refuses to negotiate. Ava Brown's biographer is certain that the women were well aware of the historical significance of those dramatic days at the Berghof. This situation at the Berghof, shortly before Stalin signed the non-aggression pact, shows how engrossed those men around Hitler were, how much the inner circle with Goebbels and Speer were involved in the political events at that time. Eva Braun photographed that tense situation at the Berghof when Ribbentrop was in Moscow and the signing was imminent. It also shows that the women were inaugurated as well. They spent the evenings and weekends together for weeks and of course they talked about these events as they were crucial for them too. Hitler didn't differentiate between private and political life. For him, it was all the same. Himmler's murder squads were given free reign in the case of armed conflict with Poland because the foreign minister's agreement with Moscow guaranteed that Stalin's Red Army wouldn't intervene but only occupy and annex the eastern part of Poland. So, Ober Salzberg played a crucial part on the path to the Second World War. All attempts to stop Hitler on his way to destruction were doomed to fail. Nine days later, the dictator declared war on Poland. Eva Braun supposedly cried when he proclaimed at the Reichstag, now more than ever, my life belongs to my people. I want nothing more than to be the first soldier of the German Reich. I have put on the uniform again that was always my most sacred, cherished possession. I will only take it off after our victory, or I will not live to see the end. On that September the 1st, 1939, Ava Brown supposedly told her older sister, Ilse, this means war. He'll leave. And what will become of me? According to Ilza Brown's memories, she also said, if something happens to him, I'll die too. The same evening, Ava Brown ordered food and drinks to be brought to the storage rooms of the Berghof. She supposedly explained, we need lots of supplies. We'll need them to last for a long time. <laughs> 